Hello everyone. This time around, I want to talk a little bit about future sustainability for humanity. In particular, how, how we might minimize our impact on any particular environment, whether that be the Earth or some planet we colonize in the future. Now, obviously, there is uh, one way we could uh, severely limit the impact of humanity's uh, existence, and that is to severely limit our population. Now, of course, I don't think that's going to happen, barring some massive catastrophe. And even if that does happen, the population will just grow back to where it is today, eventually. So, uh, ultimately, population limitation, uh, severe population limitation, is probably not going to be workable. Although, it looks like as our uh, standard of living and so on has increased, uh, in particular education and that sort of thing, uh, we may have actually turned the corner on the birth rate globally. That's not to say there aren't some hot spots around the world where uh, the birth rates are still higher than they really should be, but uh, in a lot of the world we've turned the corner on the, on the birth rate and the uh, overall uh, birth rate is actually less than replacement in a lot of the world. Uh, and that is what we need for the global population to decrease. And we do need the global population to decrease some amount. Uh, that's going to be necessary at some point. We don't need it to drop back to pre-industrial totals or anything like that, but we do, do really need it to decrease uh, because that's the best way to overall decrease our energy consumption, which is the cause of, uh, I think, our biggest impact on the environment. Anyway, uh, it looks like we've turned the corner and the current world population growth is just due to the people that are already alive reaching uh, greater age before dying. Uh, so as uh, the, uh, the uh, last uh, generation of the high high birth rate period uh, ages, uh, well, the global population will still increase. The question is, what does the demographic spread look like? And it looks like uh, we may be at a point where at least we're going to hit a peak population. Uh, so at least there is that. But still, population limitation itself is obviously not going to be sustainable as a means of being sustainable because uh, you need to convince people not to have kids and uh, doing that is difficult. Uh, anyway, uh, let's leave that aside. Obviously there has to be some limit. Population can't grow without bound, but let's leave that aside. Let's assume that uh, we settle on a popul total world population that's, uh, you know, in the 10 to 12 billion range, and let's assume that we can somehow make that work. Now, how else can we go about limiting our impact on the environment? Well, uh, obviously we can do things like recycling, uh, you know, not using materials that don't break down. Uh, so. Uh, limiting our use of plastics and and things like that. Uh, and we could maximize our use of things that biodegrade reasonably quickly. Uh, that would be beneficial uh, just to limit the total amount of junk that we have to warehouse for some time or figure out a way to break down or reuse somehow. Uh, we obviously need to also uh, deal with uh, uh, land consumption for agriculture and things like that. Uh, if we uh, continue to expand our uh, usage of land for agriculture, uh, using practices that tend to uh, destroy the land over time, we're obviously going to uh, cause issues like uh, desertification and, and things like that. And then, of course, we've got uh, grassland management and uh, you know that sort of thing that, that we can do. Uh, to uh, prevent uh, or reverse uh, desertification and, and things like that. 
Now, there's, there's known practices that we can adopt that will substantially improve uh, the ecology in areas where it's already damaged. So obviously we can work on repairing uh, ec ecological damage that we've already done. Uh, that would certainly be beneficial. But it's pretty clear that we need to do something on a massive grand scale to severely limit our environmental impact. And this is where things start to break down because in a lot of cases like people living in small communities and whatever they can't do some of the large-scale things that would seem necessary uh, and also uh, human population sprawl across the landscape is one of the things that impacts the environment right so what if instead of having thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little towns all over the place and cities all over the place and so on, what if we concentrated our population into a relatively smaller number of uh, very dense, high population density, urban areas, cities? Now I'm talking cities that uh, that have a footprint that looks rather a lot like uh, Manhattan rather than Red Deer, right? Where we densify the population as much as we can practically. Now, the reason I think that's going to be our ultimate long-term solution, there's several reasons. One is if we can concentrate most of our population into major urban areas that are relatively compact, then that reduces the total amount of land that goes to uh, simple habitation, uh, you know, houses and, and so on. Uh, it reduces the uh, footprint of our transportation networks. It reduces the need for, for vehicles and, trans and private transportation. It does a lot to reduce what we need. Now here's the good news on that front. People are moving increasingly into cities rather than staying in rural areas. So now it's down to let's do the city planning sensibly and, and get the density up instead of increasing the sprawl. And that's where we're going wrong, at least in North America, is a lot of cities are just sprawling outward and increasing the number of single family or dual family dwellings as opposed to the higher density stuff, uh, the multi-story uh, buildings and, and so on. Now, even so, people moving into urban areas that sprawl a bit is still better than having all of the sprawl spread out over the landscape, I think, because then you can you at least can consolidate some of the utility uh, operations. So uh, water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, garbage management, uh, you know, recycling, all of that stuff. Much of that stuff is much easier to do at a larger scale, the industrial scale. Uh, and you can do a lot more when you have that industrial scale uh, also because you've got the cost shared among a much larger number of people. So a city of 10 million people can theoretically do a lot more uh, with the, uh, the money it has in, as far as uh, research into improving uh, waste management and so on. Uh, now if you can keep the density uh, higher uh, then you can also uh, manage traffic and transportation much better. Uh, mass transportation works best when you have a higher population density. The reason for that is that you need fewer vehicles to run the, uh, the transportation routes. Uh, fewer vehicles can serve more people. When you have massive sprawl, the outlying areas need a lot of vehicles to collect a relatively small number of people into the central hubs, right? 
so if you can uh, densify and get more people living closer in, uh, th then you can keep the density high enough where the mass transportation actually makes economic sense. Uh, and then it's much e a much easier sell, and people are more likely to use it as well, because you'll be able to run it more frequently, it'll be more convenient. Uh, so that is a big impactor on environmental footprint, because it reduces energy use and pollution, uh, for that matter. Uh, and, it and it reduces the uh, requirements of the transportation infrastructure. Um, and now there's other things that we can do in, uh, in the cities. Um, I think what we'll ultimately have to do to really make this work is we'll need uh, new agricultural techniques uh, that basically you, you allow you to build, say, high-rise farms and, and so on, so you can, you can grow the food you need without having to take up a large amount of real estate outside of the city. Uh, and if we can crack that in a way that's economically feasible and actually works uh, properly, then uh, we can substantially contract our footprint uh, on the land outside of the cities. And that will further reduce the need for people to live in the outlying areas. Uh, is currently a lot of the uh, small towns are supported almost entirely by agriculture. And if there was no need for the agriculture out on the land, then uh, there would be much less demand for people to stay out there in the, uh, in the rural areas to run the farms. And also, if we, the more land that we can stop using for agricultural production, the more, n more land we can let go back to natural processes, and that includes things like wetlands and forests and so on, which are remarkably good at processing waste from creatures. Uh, so uh, we would have much less of a problem dealing with our uh, wastewater and our uh, even our biodegradable trash uh, if we uh, if we could reduce our overall land footprint now obviously we need to also reduce consumption of, uh, of uh, stuff that's not uh, in a sustainable uh, category uh, that means uh, electronics will need to be repairable. That means uh, we need to find better ways of doing a lot of things. We need to stop using uh, that neutronium plastic stuff for packaging things. You know, that stuff where you look at it, it cracks, and then it slices your hand off. Uh, that stuff's not recyclable, and we need to stop using things like that. I go back to... Uh, you, you know, fabrics and uh, even paper. Uh, uh, is, is a better option for packaging things or cornstarch or something like that. Uh, you know, if we, if we can go to things like that that are uh, biodegradable or basically harmless anyway, then uh, we'll have a much smaller trash problem. And going back to wastewater, if we can come up with more effective ways to treat it and remove the pollutants from it, uh, then uh, we can take the effluent coming from our waste uh, treatment, our wastewater treatment, and feed that back into our uh, water, uh, our, our potable water treatment uh, uh, system. And if we could do that, uh, then the overall footprint on the environment for... Uh, uh, for for cities becomes a lot less uh, although we're nowhere near there with the wastewater we haven't figured out a way to pull out a lot of the uh, chemical compounds that uh, get end up in the water uh, that aren't particularly good to leave there 
So uh, once we figure out how to pull those compounds out, and there must be a way to do it, uh, then uh, we can actually, a lot of these compounds, we can actually recycle them and use them again. Uh, uh, so this is what it really comes down to. We need to improve our recycling technology and that becomes much easier to do when you concentrate the people and the material that needs recycling. Uh, and as we improve that, we can lower the, the, the footprint of our cities. And if we can move more people into the cities and have less people in the sprawl, in the suburbs and so on, then we can slowly return land back to nature and let natural processes keep the land functional. And of course, we can give that a helping hand. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do that we know how to do uh, that can help reverse things like uh, desertification and, and things like that. Because that's been a real problem in a lot of the world. So uh, we actually have ways that can at least help reduce that and even reverse it. Uh, there have been experiments that have shown that if you let appropriate uh, animals out into the, the land and let them graze and do their thing and churn the ground up and everything, uh, then within a, couple, a few years you can end up with grassland reestablishing itself. So it would certainly be uh, beneficial uh, for, for that to happen. Uh, and if we need to rely on land less for agriculture, then we're less likely to make uh, the desertification things that are going on now worse. Uh, so I think overall, if we can concentrate our population in cities, well, that's going to obviously use less land, uh, but it also means that we need less energy for transportation. It means we need, uh, we need well, for all things, and that's a huge part of our uh, energy budget uh, these days and a lot of our resources go to building vehicles for transportation and things like that. If we can reduce that then we have a lot less there. It reduces what, uh, our needs for communication infrastructure. It reduces our infrastructure needs substantially. Uh, we can certainly make sustainable long-distance uh, transportation networks uh, especially if they need only limited stops uh, we can run those with electricity and so on. Uh, we, we have ways to generate electricity that are uh, a lot more uh, environmentally friendly than most of what we're using today, the fossil fuel stuff. Uh, we could go on to, um, say, thorium reactors, which uh, are basically fail-safe as opposed to fail-hot. Uh, we can, uh, you know, we can basically... Uh, uh, change what we're doing uh, and substantially improve our impact and it's much easier to do that if say like for a nuclear power plant if we can situate it say 200 miles from any city uh, and then people will be less worried about having that in their backyard and, and that's an important thing right so if, we, if we're using less land for just living on, there's more land available for isolating things that we're worried about, and it means that then we have a better chance of being able to use the technologies we already have that are better than what we're using without having to uh, uh, well, trample all over everybody, I guess. And if we can do that, it can buy us a lot of time before, or potentially buy us a lot more time to solve the rest of the issues. Now, uh, a lot of this uh, is, I guess, really common sense, and it's probably how we would actually operate if we colonize another planet. Uh, and, and that's largely because we're, we're likely going to need, at least initially, uh, domes or something to uh, create uh, an environment that's not toxic to us uh, before the terraforming can happen. And terraforming takes a very long time. So in, a, in a, uh, an environment where 
uh, terraforming would be necessary, we would need to obviously operate this way. Uh, but then the question is, will we even bother terraforming uh, if we can build these great domed cities or whatever that uh, are localized and uh, uh, have minimal impact? Why would we, would we even need to bother with terraforming, right? If we can come up with proper technology for running these things. So uh, I think ultimately on Earth and beyond, uh, we need to do the same thing. We need to concentrate our population into cities. And then focus and focus on technologies that make these cities possible and sustainable. Uh, so that means we need to come up with agricultural methods that uh, can work in uh, skyscrapers. Uh, we need to come up with uh, uh, recycling technologies, uh, manufacturing technologies, and so on that are cleaner, uh, more, and maybe even more effective, more efficient. But if we could, and if we could overall just limit the impact our cities have, if we can recycle more wastewater, more waste in general, uh, if we can use less energy per person, uh, and even even if we're just concentrating the heat output from humanity into a few places, uh, that will certainly impact the global cl climate, but I think we'll have less deleterious impacts overall than spewing a bunch of, of junk into the air continually all over the place. If it was just heat, uh, I think we could probably uh, deal with that. Uh, just e even if it just means somehow pulling greenhouse gases out of the air so that the heat can escape, uh, right? Uh, but I think we won't be able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions until we eliminate sprawl. And the only way to do that is to concentrate into dense cities. We're talking cities with hundred-story skyscrapers for block after block after block uh, where you take uh, 10 million people and fit them into uh, five square miles. Uh, if we can do that without driving each other completely batty, and I think we can with the right planning, uh, you know, then Great. Now, now, obviously, five square miles for 10 million people is probably not going to be where we end up. Even if it's 200 square miles, that's still a lot better than most of the world's population, right? Uh, if, if we could put 10 million people in 200 square miles, and that was all the people on the planet were in settlements that dense, we wouldn't be taking up much of the global land area at all. Uh, how many of those would we need? 10 million people into, say, 10, 10 billion people. We'd need 1,000 of those. We'd need 200,000 square miles. Uh, there's a lot more than that amount of land on the Earth. And 200,000 square miles would be relatively nothing compared to it. So overall, uh, you know, that's kind of the sort of, that's kind of the direction I think we need to go. And wonderfully, that is the direction we seem to be going, at least most of the migration does seem to be towards cities away from the rural areas. Uh, and if we can crack the agriculture without land thing, uh, and that means uh, people who want to eat meat, we have to come up with a way of growing meat without growing animals, right? Um, or something that people can be tricked into, into thinking is meat. Uh, and, it, you know, if we can grow all the food we need without having to get out there on the land, I think that's that and the recycling, wastewater, etc. Those things, I think, 
are the last stumbling points we really have before we can really densify our cities on a grand scale. Uh, you know, and you know, if if we pull that off, uh, then we could be looking at something that resembles some of those science fiction utopias, and maybe and and, and dystopias, I guess, but some of those uh, sparkling science fiction uh, futures and so on. We could be we could be looking at the possibility of those those grand cities from science fiction, and I think that would be a good thing. But I don't know. It might not go that way. Uh, how we build our cities, that doesn't matter as much as the fact that we need to do them and do it dense and do it humanely. And I think we can do that. Anyway, that's kind of all for my ramble on that, uh, you know, this time around. Uh, so I'll leave off. I'll, I'll just mention briefly, I have a Patreon, so if you want to support the, the channel, uh, yes, I know there's no no contributors in there right now, but if you want to support the channel, it's an option. It's at patreon.com slash lostwizard. And of course, like, comment, subscribe, share, whatever. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.